Hello everyone and welcome to our advanced deck building guide for Star Wars Destiny. If you haven't already been watching and, and reading along in our Learning Destiny series, you can find all that on our website, organized by chapter, and it's just a, a series designed to help you get into Star Wars Destiny. We covered in one of our recent videos, basic deck building guide uh, tips, which was kind of rules of thumbs for building your first handful of decks. And we didn't go into explaining too much behind why those existed. And so this video really dives into some of the concepts that those rules of thumbs are built on. This video might be ridiculous. I think this might be the most <laughs> ambitious and technical video. I mean, look at this. I've got three pages of notes in these charts. I've got four charts here that Zach handed me. Yeah, I did a... Put um, this thing together. I think, and this is beyond learning destiny. This is like... This is stuff I didn't even know. Like I, and I've been learning Destiny for the past year and a half. So. Ultimately, it's there's a really there's a couple, a couple of fundamental concepts that once you understand, you can make a lot of decisions and thinking about Destiny in ways that a lot of people don't. I actually, I wrote a blog. Kind of a mind blowing um, thing, really. About my Han Ray deck that I played at the first Star Wars Destiny Worlds. That kind of used some of these same concepts to illustrate. I was I was playing a deck that was built very differently than a lot of decks at the time. Uh, and so we're kind of we're gonna dive into this. So I, I didn't know any of this stuff. At Nobody all? told me this stuff when I when I was competing at you, Worlds. <laughs> you were just doing. No, it. yeah, you were just playing. <laughs> I, I guarantee you, ninety nine percent of the people watching this are the same way. It's like you kind of get a feel for how this should go, but I've never seen the numbers. In, yeah, I mean, you, you kind of start understand if you play enough, right? You start understanding what works and what doesn't. But a lot of times, you don't ask why it's working or why it's not working. So the two main concepts we're going to be covering that really explain everything else are the resource curve and the damage curve. And these are pretty simple, uh, but the resource, we'll start with the resource curve. And basically, if you if you picture a, a graph, which we'll animate on the, on the screen at some point. We think we will, I think <coughs> we will. We will be doing that. Uh, so in Star Wars Destiny, you gain two resources a turn, right? So yeah. the average game is gonna last somewhere between four to six turns now, thankfully. Yeah. Uh, there was a time where it was a little shorter than that, maybe one <laughs> or two turns. But no, it's gonna, you know, most games will last about four turns. So for examples here, we're gonna assume it lasts four turns, and that's gonna go along the bottom of these charts. And then each turn in Destiny, you automatically gain two resources unless something crazy is going on. What was the name of that? Uh, it's eight resources. That we, we looked at for so long. It was uh, the one that gives you plus one over yeah, it time? It gives, gives minus one to your opponent. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. like three costs. Local garrison. Minus, local man. garrison. There it is. Oh, it's still there. We, we it's very still much want to do that. But, anyways, um, so you gain two resources a turn. And that means that, you know, if you were in, you're showing that on the chart, you have two resources the first turn. Total four the second, six the third, and eight the fourth. So across a game, a four-turn game of Destiny without anything else going on, you're going to get eight resources. Only eight resources. And I think that alone, that one fact, should start informing some things about your deck, right? A four-cost upgrade, as an example, is literally half of your resources. That's insane for the entire game. Now, what? But yeah, this is, of course, absurd because uh, we have other ways of getting resources. The dice. For instance, we could resolve Characters. dice. We get character dice up front. Uh, you know, we could play cards that get us more resources than me. There's that new one that's like pay three to get four, yep. the Imperial one. Uh, so what is all this uh, simplification about? So your basic curve is going to look like this uh, just in general before right. anything else happens. So for the, we'll also be using as an example our deck, uh, the one that we'll be kind of referencing a lot, is going to be Elite Maul and Elite Captain Phasma from the two-player starter. Now, each of these characters have a resource side on their dice. So technically, turn one, we could roll four resources. Boom. We could four cost use upgrade. all four for four resources. And then our, our total resources go from eight to 12, mm -hmm. which is a pretty significant jump. Um, but you know, if we were just assuming, let's say the first turn you gained a resource and the third turn you gained a resource, uh, now you can see what the, the resource curve does uh, in those circumstances, right? You get three the first turn. Now you have five total after the second turn. Then and three eight. on the third turn, so that's eight, and then two, so now we go to ten. So two extra resources throughout the game. Um, and that's just kind of the basics of how the resources work. But even then, ten resources is not that many for you, an entire game. You know, game. you feel like you're, you're playing the game, and, you know, you, first of all, it feels like it's longer than four turns, which is actually kind of one of the great things about Destiny. I think, you know, I feel like I, I step back from a game, and it's like, that was at least six to eight turns. And you look back, and it was like, that was three. And it was just of, really complex turns. A lot of that, too, is just because it's so back and forth every turn. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get lost in a turn. A lot happens in a single turn. But, like, I'll just be like, oh, I need that resource right now. and Bring it on. You know, I don't care where it comes from, who's doing it. Uh, bring it on. I need to play this three-cost thing, and then I'll do it. Uh, but what you're saying is that maybe we should reconsider those decisions because, A, gaining resources is, like, 
obviously a thing you're doing with dice that could do other things. Sure. And then B, like we have a limited amount of resources uh, per turn, so we should adjust our decks accordingly. Yeah, and so you know you can imagine if you get two resources a turn, this is the fundamentals of you know playing a two cost upgrade as an example means that any other card in your hand that costs more than zero is effectively blank for that. Yeah. And so that's why a lot of times you'll see decks that are usually one of two ways, right? They'll be very balanced. They'll have one, zeros and ones and mm -hmm. twos and threes. And they'll have a natural kind of curve to their, their deck. And so what I like to do is lay my deck out by cost. So I'll have a column of cards, and we'll show this, but a column of cards uh, that are zero cost, a column that's one, two, and three, and then I arrange it by upgrade, control cards, and then everything else. Yeah. And that will literally, when you lay that out, show you the cost curve, right? If you have a whole bunch of zeros, you'll have a long, long row of cards up front, and it'll kind of go down towards the top of the curve. Um, but that's really helpful for seeing what's going on with your deck, because a lot of people, the fancier, flashier cards cost more money, right? Two right. cost events, two or three cost upgrades. And so if your curve, the cost curve of your deck is too heavy, most of your cards are going to be blank for most of the game. They're just rerolls. Yeah, They're sitting so they, in your hand. You can so, only play one of these four two-cost cards. So a lot of decks will balance that out with, if you have two and three-cost cards you want to play, they'll have a lot of zeros. Um, yeah. Or you'll have a lot of ones and zeros, and then you know ways of gaining resources and, and all that kind of stuff. Really, so, ones and zeros is where the money is in this game. <laughs> ones and zeros are you. good. But when, I, when I changed my decks from like, here's all the things, the fancy things that I want, theoretically, and went to like, here's the one or two fancy things that I want, and then everything else is just zero cost, do something. Because the, the, as the theory goes, you'd rather have a zero cost card that can do something or be a reroll as compared to a two cost card that's only a reroll in your hand because sure. you can't afford it, right? And like a lot of times, the, you know, what if you don't need a reroll? Right. It's like even if the zero impossible. cost, impossible. <laughs> impossible. Yeah. Right. Destiny. Uh, even if the zero cost card just adds a shield, like Take Cover did in the original Awakening set, um, it's doing something. Love that card. Yeah. And and so that's that's a really even just and we're not talking too much about like how to play necessarily here, but that's the one, last thing you guys want to know, right? One, well, you don't want to know that. <laughs> uh, but one thing too that uh, you know you can do is, uh, and a lot of people don't do this, which is don't just spend your money on an upgrade up front immediately. If you have the control cards or the cards that could prevent a lot of damage, and that's what we'll be talking about in a second, uh, you can just wait to play it. And then if you do have the money to play the card and get the effect, you can you can do that once you're in the clear and know you don't need it. Um, so that kind of segues us nicely into the other curve, which is the damage curve. It's a lot more exciting, isn't it? it? It's just a lot more complex and uh, probably more difficult to comprehend. You can pretty easily understand that you get two resources a that turn. That excites me. And you have to spend them uh, accordingly, and you're on, you, know, you only get so many of those. When it comes to damage, though, it's not just a guaranteed, here's what you're going to get every turn. So the first thing with the damage curve is it'll look a lot like the resource curve, right? So if we assume four turns, and we charted it on the chart, how many damage you're going to do on each turn, you can kind of get an idea of how much damage you're going to do across you know, the, the four or five turn game. It's just like an average. Take the die, how much total damage does it have on it, divide it by six. Is that essentially what you're doing there? So there's a lot of ways to estimate. I mean, statistically speaking, you know, like the average damage of a die is if it had a single three on it, right? You have six sides and you can do three. Uh, mm -hmm. and so uh, you could technically divide that three by six, and that's the average value of each side. But the realistic thing is if you're willing to reroll and you're willing to play cards to get to the damage side, um, we can kind of just start making some assumptions about some of these dice. So a really good example is Captain Phasma, which okay. is in our deck. So she has a one damage side, a two damage side, and then a special. How is she so cheap then, Zach? Well, that's a different question. <laughs> the balance of the force for that one. But she has a one, two, and a special that either does two, or if they have six damage, does three. So she's even more powerful in the late game. But if I'm playing Captain Phasma, I'm gonna be looking for that two damage or that special. So assuming we're willing to commit to re-rolling our dice, you know, we'll get Phasma out, we get Maul out, and we're willing to re-roll to get to these sides, I'm pretty comfortable just estimating her at two damage. Cool, like, I like that. That's more realistic, I think. I might, if I just roll like a one and a two, I might go ahead and resolve and only do three instead of four. But I think in most cases when you're playing Phasma, if you aren't messing with her dice, she's going to average about two die per per turn. Two damage. Per die. Two damage yeah. per die so per turn. So if we chart that out on a, a chart, right, so it's four damage a turn, so on turn one it's going to be four, turn two it's going to be eight, turn three is twelve, and turn four is sixteen total. So across a four turn game, she's going to do sixteen damage. Mm -hmm. Alright, easy enough. If nothing else happens. That's fine. And assuming what she could go wrong? Uh, so the, her teammate is Maul in this case, right? And so he's a little more complicated to kind of come to an average. Maul's right? always been more complicated, hasn't he? He is a complicated individual. He is a... But he's got a two and a three for one money. 
And so whether you roll the one when you don't have money or you just roll the two and you're happy with that, uh, he's probably going to get somewhere between two and three on yeah. an average turn, right? And he might roll a resource and you resolve that. And so that's going to change your damage curve with him as well. But assuming he's somewhere in between, I'm, I'm comfortable estimating about two and a half damage per die. Okay. And so if we assume that, he's going to do five damage a turn, which is <laughs> one more than Phasma. That's pretty good. But if we chart that as well, we'll see it's five, 10, 15, 20 in a game. Now, the damage curve of your deck for your characters, right, is those combined. So technically, together, they're going to do nine damage a turn, and this is what the, the curve would look like. And I'm going to let me, let fancy me, on over to the chart. Let me also, I'm going to get ahead of you uh, a little bit, or maybe behind. I, I'm not quite sure. But right. you know what's crazy, you know, just sitting here uh, engaging in this Think, kind of a dialogue, uh, is that if you have Maul with two dice, and we assume 2.5, we also assume one resource a turn to power that three side. Yep. So we've, across so four turns, we have cut two. our resources in half. Just we've gone from damage. eight to four just to power them all. And that's that's what, insane. That's what makes Phasma you know, just so good mm -hmm. uh, for her point cost. She is doing so much damage on average. She's only one damage behind him without spending the money. That's crazy. And late game, her, her special turns into a three. So it's, it's just a, a lot of damage potential. Um, and so, you know, obviously you're playing against an opponent and you can affect your dice, they can affect your dice. And so we're going to introduce an opponent here and look at their damage curve and that's going to lead us to some interesting conversation. So in this case, um, we're going to use um, Elite Ray from the two-player starter and Obi-Wan from Legacies. And this is actually the game that we're going to play uh, after this video in our advanced deck building gameplay video. I'll be playing Obi-Wan and Ray versus Steven's Elite Maul, Elite Phasma. But both uh, Obi-Wan and Rey are a little more complicated. They always, yeah, that's so true. The, you look at the abilities, right? Shields and there's, damage there's, there's of shields. Weird, weird stuff a lot of conditionals. So, so we have two Rey dice, and she has a one and a two. Mm -hmm. And similar to Maul, I, I would, I'm going to estimate for, for this purpose in this example, one and a half damage per Rey die. Easy. So you have a two, you have a one, you're going to reroll till you get it, you're going to do about one. So that's three, three around coming from Rey. Obi-Wan has a three and a pay one for three. So if he's doing damage, he's, he's doing so three good. on a single die. So we can also estimate he's doing three. So no matter which way you look at it, three per turn for them, per character. So three, six, nine, 12 showing on the curve. When you combine them, that doubles. Two, doubles. Six, six 12, 12, 12, 18, 24, I think. Means, Hopefully that, hope that math adds up. Um, so their damage curve is pretty easy. But once you have these curves, what it really lets you do, once you understand this concept, is look at when are these characters going to potentially get defeated, right? Okay. So we're going to advance along some charts here. I'm going to get I mean, at a certain away. point, can we just not even play the game and just put the charts on? And Well, you know, that's, that's not the fun part. Um, <laughs> so when we're looking at when we're going to lose a character, right, um, you just look at how much damage you're capable of doing, how much you expect them to do, right? And when is a character going to de get defeated? So with Maul and Phasma, right, they're doing nine on the first turn, potentially nine on the second turn. And right. so pretty early on, assuming they do nine on turn one, on turn two, they're going to be able to defeat either Obi-Wan or Rey. No matter who they want to go at, they're, they're going to be able to do that. And if they have a really gangbuster first turn, they could potentially do 10, 11 damage first go around, right? They, that, that's feasible. Yeah, because if you did, technically if you did both threes on Maul, mm -hmm. is six, and then Phasma Special is now a three. So even if oh, they put the goodness. shield on with Obi-Wan, I didn't even Obi consider that. Uh, you're going to get a... Even just the twos make it 10. 12 potential damage. So you could, that's why sometimes you have these explosive first turns where Ray could die first turn, which is crazy. Yeah, and one thing uh, we actually need to get to before I even, before we talk about defeating characters is the other part of the Ray Obi-Wan damage curve that I didn't talk about, which is when Ray activates, she gets to do a damage. Right. If she has a shield. So uh, while their damage curve is six compared to the nine of Maul Phasma, right? So... If we're looking at that curve, um, adding a damage each turn takes them to a seven, right? right effectively. Conversely, when Obi Wan activates, you get a shield. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that is like removing a damage from your opponent's curve. So if we had the Maul Phasma uh, curve up, we could basically just take one away from them each round and add one to ours, and we would see the effect. So of that the gets pretty curve. close. Then that's like eight to seven, right? It is eight Ultimately. to seven. So they're relatively close, but Maul Phasma is inherently slightly better at doing damage. Interesting. Um, so then we talk about defeating characters, right? So now, now we kind of with those curves in mind, with the Obi and Ray ability kind of built in. Um, 
we're talking about even still doing, you know, eight damage on the first round with Maul slash um, Phasma. And then going to the second round, they should pretty easily be able to get to the 11 damage they need to kill Ray, or even 12 for Obi-Wan. Um, and so if they defeat Ray on the second turn, let's just, let's just say they defeat Ray on the second turn. And uh, let's say Ray gets to activate, so she still gets to trigger her ability. But let's look at the damage curve if she goes away before she actually gets to resolve either or die. She rolls uh, it's going to be ugly. I don't want to look at it. She rolls discard or resources or whatever. Um, so if you look at their damage curve, now on turn two, they're only capable of dealing at, you know, based on our... Just flattens right cable, out there. They could technically do a little bit more. But <clears throat> if Ray had rolled double twos on the first turn. Mm. Uh, but doing 11 damage. So barely able to kill either character. And if obviously if on the second turn you played some kind of control card and prevented some more damage, they can't even defeat either of your characters. Wicked. And that's a that's a really big deal. Um, conversely, though, let's just assume that with their eleven damage, they attack Phasma first. So only has ten health, um, and so you know we can now look at our curve when we lose Phasma on the second turn. Now this is going to take because it's most of their damage. Uh, we can kind of estimate that that's probably going to take them towards the end of the second turn, right? Yeah. It's unlikely that they'll just open. Get rid of Phasma before we even get to use her. So in our example and in this curve, we'll just kind of show the curve as though she actually gets to resolve both of her dice for two damage on that second turn. Okay, I'm into that. Now this also brings in a, an element to the discussion that is really fascinating, which is the role of going first because you claim the battlefield. Like being able to knock that character off before they get to resolve their dice on a second turn kill is incredibly important. Sure. It also, you know, a couple other things, right? Going second means you get two shields. Yeah. So it in this case, if we were going second and we put two shields on Phasma, we don't even expect them to be able to defeat Phasma. On the ah, second that's so turn. cool. Um, and so there's just a lot of concepts there once you kind of start understanding how much damage these decks are capable of doing. Um, and it also makes you realize that you know, defeating characters, right? So like, let's say you have a card like Force Stasis, which is blue character only. And this is why it's important to understand this for deck building. But it's blue only, it's a pretty good uh, little removal card. And, but it, you know, if you put that on Maul on the first turn, and then they start attacking Maul, and they defeat him, those two resources and that card goes away. And that's a quarter of your resources. That is, that's why redeploy is so important. But conversely, if they defeat Maul first before you draw the card, no. It's a dead card when you get it. Yeah. It's blank. You can't play it. So when you're looking at your deck, understanding who is, how quickly can characters die, who are they likely to go after mm -hmm. first is important. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. But now that we kind of have this framework in mind, um, I, I want to look at how upgrades can impact the damage curve. So we, we've got basically like, here's the, the straight up basic damage curve just based on the dice. Then we introduce the, the uh, Obi-Wan and Ray abilities, and that kind of changes the curve a little bit. Then we've seen how, when a character is defeated, how that tanks the damage curve. Um, so now, where are we headed? <laughs> We're headed to Upgradeville. Upgrades, all right, yeah, Upgrade because Island. obviously something's happening in the game, right? You have a hand, you're gonna be using your resources, and you're usually gonna be using those on upgrades, control cards, or cards that have some other ability. Yeah. So we want to take a look at what those are even doing for us, right? Why are we putting them in our deck? What's the value of them? And hopefully uh, get to a point where we can really start comparing those kinds of cards. So the first thing is upgrades, right? And we'll use the cross card lightsaber as, a, as an Classic. example. Uh, so in the same way that we can estimate how a character is going to do damage throughout a game, we can actually estimate how a upgrade is gonna do damage as well. So the cross card lightsaber has a one melee, a plus two melee, and then a special that either does two damage or three if your opponent has a shield. So it costs two resources. Um, and if we play that on you know, Darth Maul on turn one as an example, um, we're just gonna bring up the damage curve here, uh, uh, still assuming that Phasma is going to uh, meet her end at the end of turn two. Uh, but you can very quickly see the impact that the cross guard lightsaber is going to have That's wild. on your damage curve. And when you think about Obi-Wan and Rey, right, they have 11 and 12 health respectively. So that's 23 health. And you can see the difference in the curve here goes from doing 20 by turn three to 24. So now you can actually potentially even defeat Obi-Wan as soon as turn three, which is important because when we're looking at their curves, how fast can they defeat you? Uh, the faster you get rid of your opponent, the better in general. Um, so but, that's great, it's important. So 
we, we showed how much damage is happening here, but just to kind of break it down, if it's a one, a plus two, and then a two again, um, you know, for me, it's like, I'm just gonna assume 1.5 damage. Mm -hmm. So it'll probably either do one or two. And if it's doing three, they actually technically have a shield. So it's, you know, there's some, some complicated stuff going on there. But obviously playing an upgrade on turn one can significantly, if you're adding 1.5 damage a turn, right? Across a four, four game turn, it's gonna be six extra damage. That's half of a character's health. Yeah. So the sooner you can knock, you know, at this point, you could, now what's the likelihood of defeating Rian turn one? Yeah. Right? With wow, before, yeah, yeah. it was, we were at nine, They get even though they get a shield, it's like, but this just amps it up even more. And so much of this seems to be about getting that first character off the board. I mean, like, that, that is so significant that all of those early efforts really need to be tailored around getting the most damage done possible to this one character. And part, part of that, really, if you start comparing the math, right, if a cross card lightsaber costs two resources, and it's a card from your hand, and that's what you're doing on that turn, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you're getting money in some other way, that is your spend of resources there. But if it costs two resources, it's still only doing 1.5 damage a turn. Maul, we were estimating at five. Yeah. So the reality of being able to save a character for one extra turn, like if Maul gets one extra turn, you get five extra damage. Yeah. Which is way more, like cross guard in a whole game, is we're expecting to get you about six if you play it on turn one. So the difference between you know saving it if it's turn three and you can save uh, either character from being defeated and get it one extra turn with them at that point, it's it's going to be worth more than playing an upgrade at, at that stage in the game. Absolutely, yeah, that's crazy. And you also start to realize that for every die you're resolving as resources, your damage curve is dropping. Yep. You know, like depending on what you're spending, then can or you spend that money? Or disrupt. If I get one resource, can I turn that one resource into more damage than what I just sacrificed by taking that die in the first place? Sure. Right? Yep. And then, so this kind of leads to the next thing for me, which is once you start having this framework of how does an upgrade actually affect my game? And even so, think about Force Stasis. It's an upgrade that doesn't even do damage. Mm -hmm. it, it's there, you know, there's all kinds of cards that um, I'm trying to think of the one cost draw card card that was in mm. your deck. Oh, yeah, yeah. A Dark the, Council, I think. There, there was also that a uh, long time ago, there was that Obi's uh, book. Obi's Journal? Yeah. Uh, Didn't so, that do the draw thing? Yeah, it's just you can remove the die to draw a card. Yeah. Um, but it's not adding any damage, and not all decks are about damage necessarily, and there's the, the capacity to resource ramp and do all kinds of different things. But the when you start realizing, you know, how much damage a, an upgrade can do. But on the other hand, like cross guard lightsaber, technically the max is another thing to consider, right? Which is if you are always hitting two with it or the they have shields, so your special is now worth three. Yeah, it can spike. Um, you know, it could be worth as much as 12 in a game. But it could also literally always roll blank. And that's why it's still a game. Because you know, anything can happen and you have yeah. to adapt you know, to changing circumstances. So once you kind of start realizing when characters are going to be defeated, what upgrades can do for you, um, the next thing to really start considering, and I think this is where it's the examples start getting pretty cool, is how control can affect these curves. Impossible to <laughs> estimate. Oh my goodness. So you know, an upgrade like CrossGuard doing 1.5 a turn, this, this, you can understand that, you can see it. Um, but you know, something as simple as if we pull the Maul Phasma curve up, um, what happens if on that first turn, you know, Phasma rolls special or she rolls two damage and our opponent has a card like Sound the Alarm? Okay. Zero, Zero cost. cost. Reroll your damage. Size, e right? So maybe you're showing a, you know, two specials on Phasma, or I guess it's not technically damage, so they can't reroll it with Sound the Alarm. <laughs> you're showing the two damage on Phasma, right? On both dice. And Maul's showing two, two damage as well. They play Sound the Alarm, you'll roll into all blanks. So now you're re-rolling, right? So now they're making you use more cards to do your thing. Mm -hmm. And let's say even one of those dice doesn't get back to damage. So it's pretty easy. You show the curve, right? And it's like you prevent two damage from happening on that first turn. So here's what happens to your curve. Now the next thing is what happens if they do the same thing again on turn two, right? So you and just it ends up costing you two damage. Mm -hmm. Any control card that removes a die or makes you reroll it and makes you miss out on damage can do the same thing. But you can start to see what kind of effect these control heart cards will have in a game. But the real effect that these cards are having, there is an immediate thing that's happening, but when it starts preventing a character from going away and you, you start buying an extra turn with a character thanks to these control cards is when those cards get very, very powerful. And that's, that's a lot more complicated to kind of figure out than how much damage is cross card going to add every, yeah, every turn from yeah, now yeah. on. But once you can start kind of estimating the value of, as an example, in this game, what's the value of a single sound the alarm on turn one? Um, now you can really start comparing Sound the Alarm to a card like Crossguard, 
Yeah. Right? Like how much damage is it going to going to net you? So a, a better example of kind of stacking those cards up and comparing them to me would be uh, cross guard versus crush the rebellion. So both two cost. Both two cost. Both can be played on turn one. Both can be turn played on turn one. Yeah. Um, and they both have interesting abilities, right? So we've already looked at cross guard and how that kind of affects the game. Um, but when it comes to sound the, or crush the rebellion, so it costs two. You remove a die from your opponent showing damage, and you deal half of that much damage back to them in indirect damage. So in our example, let's just say that Obi-Wan rolls a three. He has two three sides, that's all he can roll. Um, and on turn one, right, he rolls his three. We've estimated in their damage curve that he's gonna get three damage. And we play Crush the Rebellion. Removes his three, so now a, a handful of things happen. They're down three damage. Yeah, curve flattens. We're up two damage. Yes, but indirect. Indirect, still, so, still so it, it is damage, but it doesn't advance our getting that character off the board agenda. Well, if it's the first thing we did before That's we true. Then we can damage, target that one. Then wherever they decide to put the damage, we yeah. can start start piling on. Um, but we resolve that, and you can kind of see what's happened to the curve. But what you can easily see from these charts is now the reality is we're so much more likely, no matter where they put it, to defeat that character. And if we defeat that character, it's gonna lower the curve even more, right? But they're also now almost, like they're gonna have to really roll their max damage to even be able to kill Phasma on turn two. So if Crush the Rebellion not only adds two to our curve on turn one and reduces theirs by three, but if it even buys us a single extra turn with Captain Phasma, we're estimating that's gonna add four more damage to our, our total damage curve, right? That's amazing. So now Crush the Rebellion is two on mine, minus three on yours, plus four on mine. Yeah, because you get to keep the character in for one more So it's worth ultimately six damage to me and minus three damage to you, which when you're comparing it to something like a cross guard lightsaber, mm -hmm. uh, if, you're gonna, if you average 1.5 a turn, you start seeing how these stack up. Yeah. Now the other thing that's interesting here is that's that so weird. we're also assuming all of this happens on turn one. What happens if it's turn four, right? Yeah. Let's say it's Maul versus Obi-Wan at the end of the game, and you roll a three with Obi-Wan. So now I pay two, mm -hmm. I remove your three, I do two damage to you indirect, but you only have one character left, yeah. so it's going on a specific character, and I get the immediate impact of that right then. If on turn four, though, you play cross card lightsaber. Mistake. <laughs> maybe. Complete waste may of time. Maybe, maybe not. But the value there is, right, if you only have one or two turns left, one point, you know, one and a half damage a turn for a turn or two is not significant. Yeah. Like it's just not as, so upgrades are inherently more powerful the earlier you get them on the board. Yeah. Just as a. Is that, is that ultimately the flow of the game if we were really to think about it academically, that it really should be about early upgrades, like, I won't say not after turn one, but maybe turn one and two, invest in upgrades, and then past that, it's just like, why are we not just playing control cards until the game ends? I mean, I think the, you know, this is kind of what we're getting back around to when it comes to building the deck, which is once you start realizing that, you know, preventing three damage with a control card uh, is potentially worth a whole lot more than adding three damage with a cross card lightsaber. That's actually true. Because if you buy an extra turn with Maul, you get five. So why are we ever playing upgrades? I'll tell you why. <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah, yeah. You're like, wait a second. That was, that was kind of my thesis of that blog I was writing, which yeah, I was playing with the Vader control, and you had like I ran none. very little upgrades, and I was still able to win. But the trick is, uh, and this is what I was referencing in the first of this video on the waiting to play your upgrades, is sometimes, what if they don't roll a 3 and Obi-Wan? What if they roll a resource and they resolve that instead? Mm -hmm. Now the control card's doing nothing for you. That's it true. Has, it has no, what if they're playing, you know, a Thrawn on card deck and have no damage sides? So control is actually less consistent in terms of how it affects the curve versus an upgrade, which is guaranteed to affect the curve in more or less a certain way. Totally. And that's why it's not, you don't hmm. have 30 upgrades or six, up, like two upgrades in your deck, is that you want to have them around. If you have the resources, you can play the upgrade, build your board, start doing more damage. Um, but it's also why zero cost cards are so good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because if you can simultaneously you know, play a cross guard lightsaber and have cards like Doubt or Sound the Alarm in your hand to make you know, mitigate your opponent's dice, Interesting, yeah. then you're both adding to your curve and slowing them down, and that's the game of destiny. And so you really ultimately want a balance of a certain amount of upgrades that when you have the resources and you can play them, because also the other thing about upgrades is that a lot of times they can provide resources as well. So if you play a cross guard lightsaber, roll a resource, resolve it for a resource. Now, 
you've made one back and it's only cost you one money. Yeah. Right? So, and that lets you build into more powerful upgrades. And then I think it's safe to say, like, if we have a cross guard lightsaber at 1.5 average damage and we resolve it as a resource, then we should have a way to turn that one resource into at least as much, if not more, than 1.5 damage, either removing from us taking or putting on our opponent. And this, that's why once you understand a resource curve and a damage curve, you can now start to evaluate every card in your deck and every decision that you're making. Yeah. From that, where it's like, if you're going to spend, a, as an example, an Obi-Wan die on a resource, that resource should be worth three damage to you. Yeah. Because his die could do three. And, you know, obviously if you reroll and you're out of cards and you're on resource, it's better than nothing. But if, you're, if you have the potential to turn it into a three and you're instead choosing a resource, uh, but Ray, on the other hand, is a little easier to do, right? So in the Ray Obi Wan deck, you have two Ray dice, and the average is only a 1.5. So spending one of her dice on a resource is a lot easier yeah. if you have a way to convert it into at least 1.5, if not more damage. Absolutely. That makes perfect sense. So your less damaging die, certainly, you would more likely resolve as a resource because it's just more beneficial for you to do that. You know, the other thing that's fascinating here is like, Character like Maul being relatively expensive to power through a game uh, with damage, maybe do you just have one cost upgrades? Do you, do you, how do you account for having to pay one extra? Because I don't want to play a two cost upgrade and then have two, three damage for one resource size that I can't do anything with. I think that's, that's where deck building comes in, right? So if you have cards that can gain resources for you throughout a game, that's gonna be helpful, um, whether it's one cost upgrades, but that's something you have but to take into we also have to invest account. money into those, and we only have four turns, so like how could that possibly pay off in time? You, you've, you've you gotta, gotta do the math, it. right? I mean, I think that this is the art of deck building, or as an example, um, you know, right now you can play the Rebel War Room Battlefield that you can claim and resolve by showing a resource cost without having to pay right, it. Right, right, right. And so there's, there's a lot of, of deck building uh, that has to go on, right? So all of this framework, how does it affect deck building, right? That's kind of, that's what I want to get to, which is, I mean, it starts from the very team that you're constructing. Right? So when you're picking a team, looking at their damage curve, looking at what they're capable of, looking, looking at their health, um, that's really important. That's a, that's a big part of the team. Uh, but also knowing, and I think this is the most helpful part to deck building, if you look at your characters, right, who do you want your opponent to attack first? Mm -hmm. who, who are they likely to attack first? So when I'm playing Obi-Wan Ray, I somewhat expect you to go after Ray first. Because if you can damage her and remove the shield, you're stopping damage from happening right. to you. Right. She has slightly less health. Yeah. And she also has two dice, so she's going to be harder to control, right? Like, Crush the Rebellion isn't worth as much against her. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, Obi-Wan with one die, if you have a removal card, you can shut my whole turn down. Where Ray has two. And so, I expect you to attack Ray first. That should inform how I'm both constructing and playing my deck. Right. Don't put a non-redeploy upgrade on, on Ray. You know, or that's the, kind of the first thing. plan to get there, right? So, yeah. if you play a two cost on her, you have like heirloom lightsaber and Ray's lightsaber in your deck, and you, your game plan, right, is that as they're doing damage to Ray, you're gonna upgrade into an upgrade that's not gonna go away, then they defeat Ray, it moves over to Obi-Wan, mm -hmm. and you kind of have a macro plan going on. Conversely, with Maul Phasma, knowing that Maul's three costs a resource, I would much rather them defeat Maul first. Yeah. And so turn one, if you're looking to play an upgrade, I'm probably playing it on Maul. Mm -hmm. Because I want to, to incentivize to you yeah. to come at Maul. Same thing with if you know the battlefield, who's going first? If you get two free shields, putting that the shields on the character you don't want them to attack is usually works, right? So if Maul Phasma, if I'm looking at Maul with two shields at 13 health or Phasma with 10, I'm going to attack Phasma. Yeah. But if instead you put the two shields on Phasma, that's now, interesting. Two shields on Phasma and an upgrade on Maul means mm -hmm. I'm so much less likely to attack Captain Phasma. Yeah. Um, and so if you do that, again, having the plan, if you're putting a two cost cross card lightsaber on Maul, do you have heirloom lightsaber in your deck to upgrade that into later to make sure you don't lose it? Um, it's just kind of the macro level team building strategy. There. Because the most devastating thing is losing those resources that were invested in an upgrade. Like if we were to look at the curve and say not only do you lose Maul, but you lose the cross guard lightsaber, yeah, we, if we pull that, that thing just flattens out like that crazy. That same curve up we were looking at earlier, right? If you have Phasma who's defeated on turn two, well if instead you play cross guard on Maul mm -hmm. and then Maul's defeated, you're losing so much damage potential. It's and I, that happens all the time. I've it, seen that a million times. Yeah, and so, you know, that, as I was mentioning, that means... I think I've done that a lot. <laughs> yeah. 
f fundamentals, right? Ooh. But then it's like when you're talking about choosing a battlefield, right, for your deck, I think that's a, the next important point I want to make, which is choosing a battlefield that it, it's a macro level thing, right? Do you want to go first? Would you rather have the shields from going second? If you want to have the shields from going second, is there a battlefield that will disproportionately benefit you and not your opponent? As an example, if you were playing Phasma and you had Emperor's Throne Room, right? Emperor's resolve Throne a special. Room lets you change a die to a special mm -hmm. and resolve it. If your opponent doesn't have special sides, they don't want to be on your battlefield. So they very may, may well choose their battlefield, let you get the shields, and now that's falling right into your plan, right? Either you get the consistency of the throne room or you yeah. get the shields. And so when I'm looking at battlefields, that's really the questions I'm asking, which is, can I make my opponent pick theirs? And if so, are the shields worth it to me? If not, then I maybe want to incentivize them uh, otherwise. The other thing is going back to the balance of the deck. So I really do think it's important to lay out the deck by zero, one, two, three, and four cost. And if you consistently find yourself with one or two are the most common situations I see with new players, which is uh, they have a whole bunch of high cost cards. All the cool stuff. All the cool stuff. And that can actually work, right? Because unheard of. if you have all the options of all these cool things to do and you're going to discard the reroll, but that hides the actual thing that's going on, right? Which is if you had two of those cost cards in your hand, and then you had a three zero cost that could actually do something, you're gonna find you're in just a much better spot. You have more options. Yeah, right? and conversely, you know, normally what will happen in decks is you'll have some zeros, some ones, mm -hmm. some twos, some threes, and you'll find that the more balanced you make that, and a lot, you know, a lot of my decks, I'm only at three or four three cost cards. Because again, at eight or 10 or 12 resources a turn game, playing a four cost is just. And just think about the fact that, you know, your three cost card, theoretically, is going to come into play on turn two. Just theoretically. Like, I just assume, yeah. and that's generally how it works. Either you upgrade over something, or you, you get a resource at the end of the turn because you didn't get the damage you needed, that kind of thing. Uh, so even compared to a two-cost upgrade that gets played on turn one, is a three-cost upgrade on turn two better than just playing a two-cost on turn one? Sure. Like, where does that? Because those three-cost upgrades oftentimes aren't that much better than the two-cost ones, and those are more consistent because you can always play them early game. You know you can so always So make play sure them. if you're doing three cost stuff, like it has got to be gangbusters good. Well, and it also... I said gangbusters twice in this video now. I don't think I've ever said that now before in my life. Well, you want to go for a four? A, th a four, for, four for one here? So the... But the reality is, the thing is what makes doing like an advanced deck building guide uh, somewhat difficult is that every team and every deck is going to be built and played very differently. So there's no one right formula, right? You've, you've got to understand the concepts and the fundamentals to be able to build a deck. Because, as an example, I've seen four character decks that have several cards that can gain resources. And those decks, because they have more characters and more dice and more cards that can gain them resources, might go through 15 to 20 resources in a game. And they're going to value cards very differently yeah. than a deck that is just more fundamental and trying to be able to play all their cards and do damage and whatnot. And you even have decks that don't even try to do damage. They're just mill decks trying to discard their opponent's deck. They value that I don't even understand how they value things, right? Like that's just a different game completely. <laughs> but think, okay, think about this. this is, we have a classic. Uh, this is a, a fun example. We have a classic thing from from very early Destiny, Crime Lord, uh, which is ultimately a total of nine resources. Assuming you have to pay five to play it. Yeah. Assuming or you have four to pay five. To play yeah, 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 yeah. Assuming that. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, but but think about it. You can still do that math. So even at its best, let's say you're taking out a thirteen health character for nine resources. That doesn't look as good anymore to me. What, like, what could you have done with those nine same resources? resources? I can do well over thirteen damage just spending it on an upgrade first turn, second turn, yep. third turn. Like it is close, but it's you, you start to say like, oh, well, I get that. But that's also why you know you have um, what's the zero cost card that lets you roll the die in? Um, uh, let you roll what die in? The, Any die? It, it lets you roll as the, the, upgrade the weird trooper or the no, oh the, the, the ace in the hole thing. Ace in the hole. There it is. I knew you'd know it. It's painfully. Yeah, but that, I have a list that I throw darts at. This, this is a great example, right? <laughs> which is like nine resources for a crime lord, uh, which the special allows you to just defeat a character. Um, doesn't seem that great, in you know just general, right? Mm -hmm. Like a, a standard normal looking deck wouldn't wouldn't be like, ah, oh, this is the right call, yeah. right? And of course you can upgrade, right? You can go from a two to a three, and then a three to a five. But you've something. already kind of missed it at that point. Um, but. If your deck is built to do Crime Lord, it might be very different, right? You might have characters that can gain money, you have a lot of cards that can gain money. Turn one, you're ramping up to five. 
to put it, you know, or four to put it into play. Mm -hmm. And then it by itself has a two resource side, right? And so maybe your deck is built to ramp by turn two to get be able to use it or just play Ace in the Hole, have that's, the five money and play it. And that's where Ace in the Hole is so crazy because you can theoretically do 13 to 14 damage for what, four or five resources? I don't remember which one is the play it's, cost it's, and which one is the... Five is the pay five. You, you gotta pay, pay five. five. You pay five. So you can pay five resources to do 13 damage, 14 damage, 12 damage, whatever it is, just taking a character off the board. Yep. That alone is fascinating, but then you have to factor in what if that first cost, that first turn character doesn't even get to do damage because they just got ace in the hold off the board? Now not only have you done that much damage for that many resources, but now you're preventing that much damage for the rest of the game. Totally altering their curve. So right? you can see how it's like, oh, this can be busted if it happens consistently. Right? Yeah, and that's, that's or what, happens at all. That's it why, happens, right? Like once you understand your resource curve and your damage curve. And that you know you're effectively when you're spending resources, these should be turning into either preventing or adding damage in some way. Yeah. Uh, the only exception again is on mill when they're literally just trying to deck you. Like that's a much harder evaluation. But even with crime lord, right, which isn't l specifically doing damage, um, if you're defeating a 10, 10 health character, it is doing ten damage right. effectively. Uh, but you know the thing about crime lord is, what if they're running f five? Uh, battle droids, and they all have six health, and it's like, can you can your deck possibly crime lord five times right. in a single game? Right, that's a good question. And you're paying five resources to do six damage, which is nowhere near as good as a cross guard lightsaber, just at all. No. Even even over a couple of turns. I mean, uh, effectively five resources, you could play a cross guard lightsaber and an heirloom lightsaber, yeah. and that's going to do way. I mean, you'll kill a battle droid turn, yeah, right with with those dice. Which is actually how that should work. Because you imagine that's they would they would definitely get chopped up by those two weapons yeah. all at once. <laughs> a cross guard that? and an alert. <laughs> <laughs> Battle doors don't stand a chance. So yeah, there you have it. That's the resource and the damage curve. And really, once you kind of understand those, I think your your deck building is going to be completely different. Uh, and you start understanding even your gameplay, right? Of anytime you're spending money, is it getting you damage? How much damage is it getting you? Uh, and then that's why it's so painful to resolve a an Obi Wan die for a resource, right? If I, I, it happens, I was giving the example of doubt earlier. But yeah. if, if you play a zero cost doubt on your punts, Obi Wan die, and they go from three damage to gaining one resources, that is a great exchange. And isn't it? And the, the other thing we can say is trying the weird cards. I know that you're you're a big fan of that. I am too, of course. I generally keep trying them even when they're not working, <laughs> uh, which is the difference between us. But. I think that also things like uh, your favorite anticipator mind trick, like those two kinds of cards, if you start thinking about them in terms of what the potential upside is, yeah. like for instance, anticipate could brick six dice. Well, anticipate is often regarded as like a mediocre card, mm -hmm. right? Most people just write it off, it's right. no good. But you know, if the reason I started finding some of these weird cards is that I, I would start waiting to spend my resources until I knew I didn't need to play the control card. Yeah. Because like even cross card lightsaber, right? The most it's going to add in one turn is three. So playing it first, and it, that's a very common thing, right? Play your upgrade first, roll in your character so you get the die. But if the max that die is going to add is like two damage. And then you look at a card like Anticipate, yeah. right? Which is like, they roll in Phasma, they roll in Maul. It's like they're showing two damage, right? We estimated they were going to do nine a turn with those two characters. Even if the other sides are Disrupt or Discard or Resources or Blanks or whatever, Anticipate could literally mitigate nine. nine. Nine damage. Nine average. So the max on Maul Phasma is 12. Yeah, all so, threes. Yeah, all three. So it could also mitigate 12. So 12, res 12 damage for two resources and a card. It's crazy. Is unbelievable. Because a cross guard lightsaber does what? Six over four turns, we estimate, at 1.5. Yeah. And, and it, six, it, it costs two. It could technically do 12. Two for six. It could maybe do 12 over six turns. But again, playing cross guard lightsaber is a die you know you're going to get for as long as that's in play. Mm -hmm. Anticipate, they might just roll damage. That's true. And then it doesn't do anything for yeah. you. But I think you can at least easily see how two for six could happen in both of those situations. Cross card can consistently get you two for six. Anticipate I, I commonly gets two for six, two for eight. Uh, and also on uh, Mind Trick, same thing. Mind it's Trick like is one of my four favorites. dice, yeah, it, all it, of them average 1.5. It, You're already it's there. It's always going to do its, it's thing. But, but that's where, I mean, us even having that conversation, it. right? Once you know a resource and damage curve concept, you can start having that conversation. Yeah. What's the difference between anticipate and a cross guard lightsaber? That's 
a weird question. It's actually question. in front of us, but we, we can kind of figure it out. And you can which do that cool. literally, I mean, you can throw in any two cards. So when you start watching and you start looking at your hand, right? And it's like, well, here are my options. I can play this control card right now, preventing potentially this much damage or specifically this much damage, right? Mm -hmm. Two mall dice showing damage if I have a card to remove two of your dice. That's, that's big. five or six damage that yeah. I know I'm preventing. Can you do better than that with anything else in your hand? That's, and that's really the question. That's really the trick. That's, that's when I got onto the like low upgrade count just craziness because it was like, oh, if my opponent's showing six damage and I can remove those instead of playing a single upgrade, not only am I stopping the six, how many more turns do I get with my characters now? Yeah. Right? And if, it, if I stall one, if they have to spend an extra turn killing my first character... I buy that much time with my second character as well. Yeah, that's wild. So, so the results there are just massive. That's cool stuff. Cool to understand. Advanced Thank deck you for building indeed. And, advanced uh, playing, advanced everything. Advanced I feel like things. I'm more advanced than I've ever been with this game. So that's great. That's great to hear. We appreciate you guys watching. We do have uh, all of these uh, videos and blogs. we got deck lists. We've got the whole series over on a website, so check it out there. Uh, you can also, of course, find the YouTube playlist, but it's just less exciting because... All of this and more could be at your fingertips in an easy-to-consume format. So check that out. Uh, we appreciate you guys watching. Take care.